I wanted to share a word with you today entitled Lessons from Grace. And um, <laughs> it's funny because obviously we had a tropical storm, a.k.a. a hurricane called Grace. And then there's a book that I've read a couple years ago. It says, what's so amazing about grace? Grace, by definition, spiritually, is the supernatural empowerment from God. It's also in Ephesians, it says that we are saved by grace, amen, um, by faith, so that nothing can be boasted, meaning that it's a gift from God. So, hey, so as we explore different aspects of grace, the tropical storm, and the lessons from that, we're also going to intertwine that with God's grace, amen? Because one of the things I'm learning is that everything in this world is a teacher to us. If you're not using the opportunity to learn and to grow from everything that you've encountered, you miss, you, 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 you're you not embracing the fullness of what God wants to actually um, share with you. And so instead of, for me, complaining about the um, aspects of grace that maybe without having electricity, I look at things like, never had electricity, but I had water all day. Um, I looked at it like, you know, a lot of trees removed, but maybe those trees need to be removed in the first place. Um, if they can be salvaged, maybe they could be salvaged. But there's so much of the aspects as I was going through the storm. And maybe when you were going through the storm in your district or in your home, your apartment, family member home, whatever you were going through, maybe you were also a little bit more reflective than usual. And that's what happens when you go through a storm. You become a little bit, uh, you grow in a greater awareness. And that's one of the greatest gifts that God gives us through storms. So let's talk about this little thing. Two and a half pages. Let's be um, encouraged from God's word. So when I, when I think about storms, I, I, the first thing that pops into mind is preparation is key. Preparation is key. Now, I'm a very optimistic person. And sometimes I'm a little bit hopeful and, and, I'm, and I'm struggling sometimes by um, that my hopefulness doesn't disconnect me from my current moment. But I'm super hopeful. And what hopeful, what the, the definition of hope is knowing that the future will be a lot better than what I'm currently experiencing. And, and, and when we have faith, we actually have to have faith that is fueled by hope. Because if our faith is not fueled by hope, our faith will be fueled by fear. And, and so I want to encourage you that as, as myself, as a struggle, when this storm was happening, I told my coworkers, we're going to be all right. And we were all right, but I just let you know that I, I lacked an awareness of potentially what could happen. But uh, as you might have done, you, you went to Foster's. I went to Foster's or Hurley's, not the day of, not the Tuesday, but I went there Monday. I made sure I at least have a day and a half full of um, food. So just in case the market were closed, um, I started calling my tenants. I started thinking about what to do. So I was moving in action because faith without works is dead, and that's part of preparation. So, but I'm going to be totally honest, I wasn't prepared as I should have been. I didn't have that much damage in the whole situation, but I wasn't as prepared. So, one of the things I begin to see people doing when they're preparing for a storm is the removal of debris. You see the, the boat man go get his boat. You see uh, the, the landscaper guys trying to cut off and prune. You see the, the person in their home, they start to move things. You see people start to, like for myself, when I came home, as soon as I came home Tuesday evening, I was moving outside furniture, putting it inside my house, putting it on the wall. These little things, again, it looks really good, great decor, but when a storm is coming, you got to put that stuff away. You got to move quick. You got ark, and so people begin to prune their trees. They cut their branches to pick up the, the fruit from their trees, etc., and begin to limit the impact of flying objects to their home. Now, you saw the song that we said we will build our house upon God's love and foundation. There's also that scripture that says that the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the storms came. I want to let you know that the house um, in scripture represents us. A house in scripture represents you as a total person. And just like how you as a total person have parts, your house have different parts. The bedroom is the intimacy and relationship. The kitchen is where you work and where you work out the issues and stuff like that. The bathroom signifies um, the refreshing, the repentance, the, the cleansing, the holiness of God. Because that's what we do in the bathroom, you know what I'm saying? So our house, just like ourselves, have different parts. 
And just like how we prepared for our home, the place that offer us protection and shelter, and we remove the, the things that could potentially harm us, we need to do that as a people. So those are some of the lessons where I'm going in regards to grace. So we remove these things because it minimizes the impact of flying objects, uprooted trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So like a storm, God's words encourage us to let go of everything that so easily entangle us. And so when storms are happening, just like we're preparing with this debris, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, talking about believers. If you read Hebrews 12, it's all about believers. It's all about the people of faith who actually went before us. And every one of us have somebody that went before us in faith. Whether it's a grandfather, grandmother, a neighbor, or somebody. And the Bible says these people who died in faith are now a part of this thing called the cloud of witnesses. Now, I can't fully explain this, but we see this happening on the Mount of Figuration, or Transfiguration with Jesus. The Bible says Elijah and Moses was there, but they dead. How is Elijah and Moses there who are dead? They're a part of this thing called the cloud of witnesses. We see Saul trying to get wisdom from Samuel, who's dead, and Samuel rises up and says, why you disturb me from my rest? These are part of some people call the cloud of witnesses. So while we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run this race with perseverance that is marked out before us. So if you and I, when we get heads up from the... Uh, the Florida system, the N whatever thing, National Association that gives us information, when John Tibbetts gives us information, when the premier sends out a little thing, when the governor says a little thing, when our HR policy sends a little thing, and that activates something in us to be prepared physically, why aren't we prepared spiritually? Because the Bible says storms are going to come. And I'm going to read a scripture soon to encourage you on that. So just like the storm, um, when we prune in the, the trees and we prune in this, what would happen if we in our own lives prune the potential harms? Okay. When a storm is coming, people begin to remove the excess. What if we begin to remove the excess in our life? You know, a storm is good on this area where it makes us pay attention to things that we should be paying attention to. Like we should have paid attention to our mango tree that was bent over. We should have paid attention to that breadfruit tree. We should have paid attention that our, our gate, 15, 20 years old, we need to put some reinforcement. We should have paid attention that we should have insurance policy. But we don't pay attention to those things because we kind of live happy-go-lucky until there's a storm. So, but when there's a potential harm, there's something that is activated in the humans, and the, the, the human part of us, like, wow, we need to get ready. So there's an awareness of things that normally we wouldn't pay attention to. And that's one of the blessings of a storm. So preparation is key. And we talked about the removal of things in our outside and stuff like that. The next thing I realize is that lack of preparation is a challenge as well. Sometimes we actually go in the place of panic or chaos because all of a sudden there's a storm and we're unprepared for. So you have people who bought all the waters... And I couldn't buy no water. I didn't rent, but because I bought a little bottle, bought a little bottle, because I know I'm going to have a day and a half. It's just me and my wife, possibly the kids, if they're there, but they stay with their mom. But really and truly, I don't need three cases of water. I don't. I just need a bottle for a day. Maybe the toilet paper, like we found in the pandemic. Now, out of all the things that we're going we're gonna to take care of ourselves, we're going to go and get toilet paper. So Amazon, you couldn't even buy toilet paper. What about sanitizer? That was good, but it was just this excess because we're operating in panic. And when a storm comes and we haven't prepared or we haven't been pruning and we haven't been adjusting, we haven't been tweaking, we go overboard. And when we operate, we're supposed to be getting rid of things and be prepared for things to buckle down and be strengthened. We actually add more stuff in a different area in our life. So lack of preparation in a storm could potentially be harmful to us. Now, my question for you is, what would happen if we practice preparation in our own lives? 
If you're going through relationships and you know, and this is me speaking from experience, if you know that, hey, things didn't work in this relationship, I need to learn lessons from my past. I, before I go into a new relationship, what do I need to do? Then I need to be honest what worked and what didn't work. I need to go and get my heart checked up. I need to get my mind renewed. I need to talk to someone because if I'm focused on my past and I'm not present in my present, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to forfeit my future. Let me say that again. If we're, not, if, 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 if we're focused in our past, 2000 and whatever, if we're not present in our present, making the decisions now to better our future, we forfeit our future. So preparation is key. What if we were to prepare and practice preparation in our lives? What would it look like if we picked our fruit? This is an avocado. When the storm was happening, obviously there's trees blowing and stuff like that. Now, I do not have a pear tree. But when winds are blowing, and a man got fruit on his tree, and he haven't picked his fruit, woe is me. <laughs> I went out in the storm. Baby, I hope this is ripe enough to eat now or maybe too ripe. Maybe too ripe. That's another problem. Um, but I picked up this another man's fruit that he didn't pick. So guess what happens, you know, what would it look like if we picked our fruit in the right season? We've been sowing, we've been growing. What if we pick our fruit that we need right now and begin to use it in our life right now? Because what happens is if we don't pick our fruit, when the storm comes, guess what happens? It falls off the tree. And when it falls off the tree, you do what I did. Other people benefit from your fruit. So now my neighbor, and I'm going to say he named he missing a pear. It went in my yard, so I didn't steal it. But the reality is, is that you have to use your fruit. You have to pick your daily fruit. Be patient with yourself. What have you learned today that you didn't learn yesterday that you could activate right now? So that's one of the things with the storm. You have to pick your fruit. What would it look like if you prune your trees on a continuous basis? I think women are really good at this. They take care of their hair, they take care of their body, all that different stuff. Awesome, and, and that's really good. But what if we took care of our soul? What if we took care of our mind? If we found ourselves a little bit fearful, why don't we ask the question, why am I afraid? What is causing this fear? What happened? Because I had peace, but now I don't have peace anymore. Peace is something that you can help her right there. Peace is something that you can actually drop, you know. You ever, like, woke up really good, and you did your devotion, and you felt good about life, and before you drove out your house, some other person told you about something that happened in their life, and all of a sudden your peace is disturbed? Or what about the fact that you got everything started, but before you go home and you're going to sleep, you're going to read one last text or last email that just throws you off? What I am realizing, guys, is the most precious thing I have is peace. And neglecting the facts does not give you peace. We had a storm. There is a storm. When Jesus is in the middle of the storm and he's sleeping, he's not neglecting the storm, you know. He's just aware that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So when we begin to lose our peace, all we got to do as believers is to ask ourselves, where did we drop it? Where did we drop our peace? Because if we dropped our peace, we need to pick it back up. The reality is we need to use our fruit. We need to prune our trees. And we mustn't give up our peace. Okay? Check this out. <clears throat> if we were to prune and be prepared on a daily basis or a seasonal basis, then what would happen? We would be so prepared that we would actually be living what the Bible says. We would be ready in season and out of season. Now, I work with people, and, I, and God bless them. I love them, and I'm praying for them and bless them, and I'm always encouraging, and we all work with people here. But I realize the people that get stressed out the lot at work is those that are not prepared. If work starts at 8.30 and you showing up 8.29, 30 seconds, you're going to be stressed out. I guarantee you. One of the things I start to do in my life, guys, is I start to have something called wisdom strategies. 
I got wisdom strategy for church. You know why? Because I actually failed in church. Dominique was there. I got wisdom strategy for work because I actually fail at work. I blow my head top at work. That don't look good. If I want promotion and promotion come from the Lord, then I'm going to have to control my little anger or my little frustration with somebody else or myself. So I start to think about what do I need to be wise and be successful Z, in my life. I got to show up to service at least four to five minutes before anybody get here. Now, I used to charge my mic. My little Filipino friend, because he had service in here, was charging, but I guess he put it on long, so I forgive you, pastor. So I have to actually, I used to be, you see the little kids and stuff get a little excited. I, I used to be so, att- the kids, I get these kids sorted out. No, they're not disturbing my peace. I just being honest. The kids not wrong, they're kids. But with us now, we're trying to control, so we don't get frustrated. So I start to realize, okay, what's my priority? Daddy, they care or preach the word? I ain't gonna preach the word. Then I realized, oh, I'm gonna have to give people at least two minutes to settle after the worship. So, what do you think I did today? I practiced that. Come give an offering, take the kids to the bathroom, stuff like that. Then I realized that after church, I don't have the capacity as a human being. I love people, but to pour pour out again and do ministry right after service, so I don't do that no more. You're going to have text message, pastor, if you can, we chat. And I'm fully available on another day, but while I'm so vulnerable and while my energy ain't not wise, so I've been more successful because I prepared, because there's going to be a storm. This is the church filled with family. It's going to be a kid. Kid's not a storm, but we got prepared. That's why we got Dom, um, Damien inside there and his wife controlling the children's church because we want children here. Now, what if we do that in life? There's going to be a, a customer that's going to irritate you. Be prepared. So on my, on my desktop, in my life, in my work, I got every aspect that I can think of that a customer would ask for. This application, that application, that. And I just have it stored in a folder. So when they ask for it, boom, I got a template, I send that. And why are we getting upset when areas of our responsibility needs to get done? It's your responsibility. What is responsibility? Stewarding whatever you create. That's a responsibility. My kids are my responsibility. Part of their creation, they're part of my responsibility. So regardless of what they're going through one season, I'm going to be there. So I realize that we make a lot of excuses and we get frustrated with things that God is always using in our life. Be prepared for that. So, guys, I just let you know, every June to November, hurricane season. Be prepared. Negotiate with your um, insurance company every year because they will tell you. Right now I got an email this week. My, uh, my car is up in November, but they emailed me today or last night. Do you want to renew? There's three months in advance. They want me to be super prepared. Guys, storms are going to come, and some people think because they're godly or they're righteous, storms are not going to come. I, I beg to differ. I'm telling you that the church in our last 20, 30 years, we've taught people how to name it and claim it and have faith, but storms still come. We need to teach people how to endure, how to let go of this bitterness and anger and all this foolishness that weigh you down and waste your energy and how to minimize your friends and how to bring people in your life that's going to only go to add to you, only going to multiply to you, not subtract and divide. I cannot tell you that I have one person in my life that takes from me. If you take it from me, I've given you access to take from me. And I have a part of me in my overflow that you can get that from me. But now when I'm vulnerable, you can't touch me. Now when I'm going through my own crisis, Jesus Christ, when John the Baptist died, he went to the mountaintop and he prayed because his cousin just passed away. You can't expect Jesus to go now and preach. I'm human too. So part of our frustration is unhealthy boundaries that we need to set with people. So you can't text me past 8 o'clock because I got children and I got a wife. So I'm saying my priority is so we get in frustration and we're getting unnecessary storms because of lack of preparation. So if I'm going to be a husband, I need to find out what a husband is. If I'm going to be a wife, I'm going to find out what a wife is. If I'm going to be a businessman, I need to know my industry because there's going to be cycles of plenty and a little bit of lack and we got to be prepared. God in his word gives us a heads up. 
John 16, verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Where will peace going to come? From God. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage or be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What is Jesus Christ saying? He's saying trouble is out there. Don't isolate. Don't be a hermit crab because I learned today that people actually live longer by connection. No matter how healthy you are, if you put somebody that is 55 or 60 now on their own without human connection, it takes away at least a minimum of five years of their life. Get a cat or something. So God is telling us, be prepared. There's trouble. Uh, in this same verse in um, um, the Passion Translation says, and everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you and will give you great confidence as you rest in me. Where is my confidence resting? He doesn't say mustn't prepare. He doesn't say ignore your tribulation. He's saying it will happen, but while it's happening, find me. And where am I? In you. For in this unbelieving world, you will experience troubles and sorrows, but you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. He tells us this, uh, th there's a time and a season for everything. Ecclesiastes 3 says, to everything there is a season. Now I'm using the storm season, but in your life there are seasons. There are seasons of transition, and transition is hard because we've gotten familiar with what past season. So it's hard to take off our, our, our closet and clean it out. It, it is hard to downsize and, and buy a new place or sell our place. It is hard to think about transitioning to a new job because we're so invested. But when God breathes on something and he blows in your direction of another season, let go. Because you're not going to win against God. You're going to get uprooted. So let go. It's actually surrender is the only way to find peace. God, I don't understand. Okay, trust me. All right. I'm a little anxious. He's telling you, don't ignore your anxiety. There's something fueling it. What's happening? Talk to me. And because you've talked to me, give me time to deal with it. Don't give it to me and you carry this problem back in your pocket. Give it to me. Let me deal with family. Let me deal with finances. Let me deal with your faith. Let me deal with your trouble. I search me, O God, David said. David said, I'm going through a lot of emotion. It's all about to kill me. I'm supposed to be king. I'm not king yet. I only got 400 men. All of them in debt. They can't tithe. They don't know nothing that's going on. All this different stuff. I got baby mama drama. Oh, my God. I can't feed my brethren. This is David's problem. He said, search me. The man got problems. And 15 years after his promise, he's appointed king in Judah and then king in Israel, and he becomes a king with problems that God says, he's a man after my own heart. Hey, your problem doesn't discount what God has called you to, to face and conquer. So this is what we need. We need a renewed mindset. We need to move from a reactionary mindset where we're just running, and we're buying toilet paper, and we're buying water to be prepared. We're simply always responding and reacting to life. That is why we're tired. Because all we're doing is responding. There's going to be a meeting next week. There's going to be budget. There's going to be this. Your mommy birthday coming up. Buy her something from now. Think about that. Your husband birthday coming up. Dorothy, think about that. I mean, <laughs> uh, my, my son birthday coming up. Um, you got to do this. It's preparation. And what you know why we have stress? Because stress begins to come in our life when we face something we're unprepared for. Think about what you stress about right now. You feel stressed because you're unprepared for what you're currently facing. But I come to bring you good news. God is taking care of what you're worried about. What are you worried about? God's taking care of it. He wants you to come into that revelation. So we need a new mindset. We need to catch a revelation, not just seek information. You know, part of our anxiety is that we always want to be the first with information. We want to go on this website to know it first. Come off the website. Spend five minutes with God. Trust Him. 
Let me read, let me read, let me read a scripture that, man, I'm going to tell you that this came to me. I'm going through something in my life, and I believe there's a transition of upgrade in my life. And I was thinking about it, and I said, God, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And God, I still trust you even if it doesn't happen. And I just love you, and I'm going to still be there for you, and I don't even know. And then the last scripture of Proverbs 22 says, if you are uniquely gifted in your work, you would rise and be promoted. Okay, God, I'm, talk, I'm talking about progress. I'm talking about career choices. I'm, I'm trusting you. And Proverbs 22, at verse 29 says, If you are uniquely gifted in your work, you would rise and be promoted. You won't be held back. You will stand before kings. So what do you think I did? I stepped back in my little rocking chair outside. Let it be so, Lord. If it in this season, give me the promotion. If the next season given a promotion. But what I need to do is not pursue promotion, but be excellent. I don't have to pursue it. Promotion is going to come because his word says if you're uniquely gifted or if you're excellent in your work, you would rise and be promoted. I don't got to look for it. It's going to come. It's going to hunt me down. Promotion will hunt you down if you grow in excellence. Different perspective. So we need to catch our revelation. What is a revelation? A revelation is the sudden knowledge of God. Okay, why did the storm that was ravaging against the disciples uh, all of a sudden come to, to halt? Jesus expressed the revelation to them. Peace be still. Why did the woman with an issue of blood that Pastor Glenn preached about last week all of a sudden get healed? 12 years, that's a long time. I can't even go 12 months without God answering a prayer. I feel frustrated. I feel numb. I feel blah, 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 God, you don't love me anymore. 12 years, this woman could not worship. She had an issue of blood. She didn't, couldn't have intimacy. She couldn't have relationship. She was isolated. But the Bible says she thought in her mind, that's a new revelation, and then she did something about what she thought. She touched the hem of his garments. So that means that the whole back of my miracle, a lot of times is not on God. It's on me. Because I need to get a sudden burst of the knowledge or awareness of God, and then I need to do something about it because faith without works is dead. What we tend to do as human beings, God bless us, we try to get more information that's trying to actually bring about change in our life. But people who know better don't always do better. But it's a revelation. When you become a believer, it's because you believe that while you are still a sinner, Christ died for you. Boom. Thank you for the revelation. When you're frustrated and you realize that you could cast your care on God, woo, God cares for me so I can cast this on him, that's a sudden burst of revelation. So we don't need information. We need revelation. Because operating out of revelation brings transformation. I want to encourage you. One of the things that happened in the Bible, wrap it up in 10 minutes, Paul and Silas caught a revelation in Acts chapter 16. They went to minister a demon-possessed girl. They cast out the demon that were in her, the, the spirit of divinity that allowed her to read people's palms and read people's minds. And that's happening in the island. Don't be alarmed. That's always happened. We just got to release the light of Christ and show, them, show people who want to know their future the spirit of truth, which is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit inside of us. Because people always want to know the future, but we don't have to connect them to the future. We got to connect, the one, connect them to the one who knows the future, and they'll have peace. So they cast out this demon. The woman couldn't work the more because now she can't read palms, and she can't read minds, and she can't read hearts. And so her, ma her, her, her owner is upset, makes a report. Paul and Silas get cast in the jail. Now they're in the jail, and the Bible says they're in the dungeon. They're in the heart of the jail. They're in the heart, and it's at midnight. They're in chains. You ever felt like you were in chains? And then it's at midnight. It's at the height of their depravity, of their challenge, of their circumstances. And the Bible says they started singing songs and praising God. So that means that no matter my circumstances, I still choose to be free. So they caught a revelation that oh, physically I can't move, but if my spirit can move, they can't imprison my spirit. They can't imprison my mind. So I'm going to begin to speak. I'm going to begin to preach. And all of a sudden, suddenly the earth shook. And all of a sudden, suddenly there was an earthquake. And all of a sudden, everybody was free and nobody went nowhere. Paul and Silas stayed because they knew that if they went and have that physical liberation, somebody will be put to the stick and die which would be the, the jailer. Guess what happened because they stayed after they were free. Salvation came to the prison man house. 
Sometimes when you're free, God still wants you to linger for a second because somebody needs to observe your freedom to express freedom in Christ. Your victory, not just for you, it is the victory that even though you're in chains, God just shook it up and you stay and say, watch me. Watch my God. And all of a sudden the house got saved. And so, guys, this is the revelation I want to pour in your spirit today. What happened in the prison? They caught a revelation. They caught a sudden knowledge of God. And anybody that needs to be loose could be loose today even though their circumstances is still being worked out. Amen. So God's provision, I got a little story real quick. God's provision for you can be found in your lack of preparation too. God's provision can also be found in the midst of our lack of preparation. I'm so good. I'm so glad that God loves me. I, I have an apartment, and I'm not the best landlord, but I'm a good landlord, but I'm not the best. I'm just being honest. And I checked on uh, one of our tenants, and the tenant said, I, I need to get the shutter. It's a two-story place. And I'm like, okay. I go in. Now, Z, I don't know why I'm doing. God has blessed me with this mic and a pure heart, but that's about it. I'm not skilled. I can't fix nothing. I'm not good at IT. I can't use a hammer. I, I could change a tire because they put a block and you jack it up and you do, 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 do. I could do that. But the, as I got to my apartment, I saw a construction man to the right side of my car. And on his big truck, you know, the little truck that the workman got a truck in the, in the Japanese truck, you know what I'm talking about? He had the tallest ladder I ever saw. And so I said, God, you're so good because why? I was supposed to come here 530, but now I'm here at 612 on the storm, pre-storm night on Tuesday night. And I know nobody got time. Anybody got time for this? And I'm just looking over at this miracle in front of me. And I'm like, I'm going to use my gift of persuasion. To get this guy to help me. But I did not need, I didn't need to do that. The construction guy looked at me. He said, I know you. Remember I told you Proverbs 22, a good name is better than riches. I could not pay for a man to come and help me because everybody doing their own thing. And so because of my name, he said, I'm going to help you. Then as the other guy, who I thought was the boss, he's not a boss. He lives down the road. He said, listen, I know you know my mother. This is a big man. He's like in his 50s. He says, your mother and my mother know each other. And he began to tell me and he began to tell me, I didn't realize that my first time running in a half marathon, I raised money for his mother. So in my lack of preparation, if I just show up where I need to be, where God's called me to be, where my responsibility says, do move, stay here. You don't know what to do, but show up. God's going to have a ladder for you. And you know what I did after that? I took a picture of the guy's shirt so I could get his number. So then, you know, he, he lived down the road so he could just fix it for me. And next thing is neighbor's trees, like I told you, end up in your yard. <laughs> And their fruit too. Development, guys, exposes your home. You know that, right? Development around our nation exposes your home. All right? Because development exposes your home, adaptation and flexibility is necessary. You can't stop the progress, but what you can do is be flexible and adaptable. So when you see something clear out, that tells you, I need to get a wall. You understand what I'm saying? Don't be cursing the developer. Yes, there should be integrity and all the different stuff with developing, and they're working on that. Thank you, God. All the different stuff and ecosystem, all of it. But I love you, Jesus. Thank you. But what happens with development, it exposes you. Now you see what's in that bush. Now all of a sudden, you can't go outside because it's mosquitoes. So you adapt. Now you call someone, the wizard people, to in screen your back porch you see what i'm saying if we know how to do that in the natural why don't we do that in the spirit we also need to know that our healing check me on the laughing i come to bring the word today what do you call another wizard you know the screen people praise the lord i give you a little wizard screen came on check them out i always love their art because they make me look like i need that i don't have a porch in my backyard but it made me feel like i need to build that just to have that screen just they have a good church over there too, so that's good. So development exposes our home, so we have to adapt. And the next thing, we also need to know that our healing benefits the world. Your fruit benefits Felix. <laughs> Your peace, I got to steal it sometime. Z, Z give, me a, give me a peace. Dorothy, give me a peace. Because when my life is chaotic, I need to know that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. 
The next thing I'm learning is that individual responsibility gives way to collective prosperity. My individual responsibility to take care of my mind, to take care of my heart, to take care of my soul, to steward the gifts that is in my hand, going to bring collective prosperity to my, my group of people who I'm called to. You, you guys, when you get mature, more fruit happens around you. When you heal from trauma, you can see clearly and you could actually plant the right seed. And you can see the fruit coming. The next thing I'm learning is that the storm around you is subdued by the peace within you. Nobody's going to calm that storm but you. The next thing I'm also learning is the storm around you can also be fueled with, by the storm within you. So when you're working with people and they got a storm, you go with your storm. Because I'm not going to fuel that storm inside of you. Because I got peace inside of me. So I begin to release that. Go ahead. But I just bless you. The truth is greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. And the goal is to never ignore the storm, but to develop the tools to subdue it and weather it. Storms going to come. Life challenges going to come. Times of loneliness going to be there. Times of people going to be offended. Woe to you. Everybody's going to be offended about you. If you text right now that 2 plus 2 is 4, somebody's going to say, but 5 take away 1 is 4. If you say you're for masks, then there's going to be someone saying no mask. If you say you're going to part of vaccine, there's going to be someone no vaccine. If you, it's like back and forth. We can go all this. There are going to be people that are going to be offended. So what I do, I just, I just develop tools to subdue the storm or weather it. That's endurance. So if you comment on my Facebook and it don't make sense to me, I give you a day until I delete it. That just means that I'm going to unfollow you for 30 days and give you a chance to redeem yourself. And if you're still talking foolishness within 30 days, you get unfollowed. And we're still friends, but because of my mental space in my heart, because I'm pruning, I'm pruning. I can't have excess. I can't have excess worry. I can't have excess stress. I can't have, no, 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 no. I already got troubles. So you hold on to your foolishness to yourself. Our weapons are tools. It is not natural, but we have tools. Our tools of praise, our tools of thanksgiving, our tools of wisdom. They're tools. Use them. The next thing I'm learning is that we have to invite God to heal aspects of our life that a storm exposes. When a storm comes, it exposes us, and we realize, oh, that little space in my mind and my heart is still there. God, come, come, come deal with that. Ooh, I still have anger issues. I still have this. I still have that. And I over that experience. You know, one of the things that the storm did was it, it, it ignited us back into a, a challenging memory of Ivan. And my Ivan was tough for me. And I had to, my wife and I had to talk it out. Why are we feeling like this right now? Power is about to come on. The storm has passed. But there's still this unsettling in our spirit. And we can't ignore it. We just need to invite God into the area that has been triggered by a storm. And guys, I said this before, but I'm saying it again. There's somebody else counting on you to be healed because your individual responsibility gives way to collective prosperity. Because my brother had a a fruit tree. And going back to it, it dropped in my yard. Now I can have avocado toast. Now this is a natural fruit. But what if you learned something in a season that I have never been exposed to? And now you have it on your branch of life. And you're saying, Felix, I know what it is to be pure in a season of life where you feel unpure. There you go. Take a fruit. Felix, I know what it is to apply wisdom in relationships. Be yeah. Take it, Felix. Felix, I know what it is to be financially stable and prospering. Take a little bit of wisdom. Felix, I know what it is to forgive quick. Oh, forgiveness is not for them. It's really for you because you don't want to be tied to all this unhealthy hindrance in your life. Take a fruit. And sometimes people around you don't know they have the fruit because they don't know how to communicate their healing. So guess what happens? The fruit, God is so good, the fruit would drop off. You just catch it. And you use it, and you eat it physically or spiritually speaking, and you make your soul get healed from someone else's fruit. So guys, these are the lessons <clears throat> that I am learning from grace. I'm sure you got more lessons than me. 
I'm sure you've been meditative as well. This is just from the perspective that I can filter and communicate to you as God released to me. There's more to be unraveled, but grace, the storm exposed something. Let's get healed. Amen? Was this word good? See you next week. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this amazing church and this avocado. 